A portion of today's video is sponsored by Fractal Design. So today I'm gonna to show you how to turn your Wooting 60 HE from this into this. I'm gonna cover what you can and can't do with the Lecker switch. We'll look at building in a tofu aluminum case. We'll look at some noise dampening, tape mods, some burger mount action, and we'll talk about a plate swap. If you saw the full review, the Wooting doesn't sound bad as far as gaming keyboards go. It's got decent stabilizers, sound dampening. This is what it sounds like bone stock right out of the box. It sounds pretty similar to like a Ducky 1-3 as they both have steel plates. I showed a build in that review of the Salvation case and GMK caps, but I didn't do a sound test because the switches weren't rotated south facing and they weren't lubed. There was no noise dampening inside that case and I didn't think it was a good representation of what you could do with this board. See, that's pretty rough. We'll come back to that later, but first let's talk switches. One of the comments on these liquors is that the springs were a little heavier than in the Apex Mini. The stock springs will just call 60 weight. So Wooting's doing aftermarket springs available in 50 weight for a decrease in the pressure it takes to push a key. The first run of these had an issue at the factory where they forgot to make them out of non-magnetic steel. And as you can imagine, that doesn't play very well with the switch that operates via magnets. So these should be back in stock pretty soon. Personally, I'm just fine with the stock weight, but if you need a lighter spring, if you spam a lot of keys, or you play for a really long time, then you can go with these. I don't think it makes a big difference to the sound. Getting into these, the big thing to point out here is that the stem on the Lecker is thick, girthy versus their standard MX counterparts. So those of you wanting to do dual stage or long springs, no dice. Magnum stems means magnum springs. So no, standard MX springs will not fit in the Lecker switch. Based on all my testing, there are no parts of the Lecker switch that are compatible with any other MX switch. The top housing is different to accommodate the different shape on the stem and the lower isn't compatible with anything else because there aren't any contact pins. But the overall switch itself does have enough similarities to an MX switch to where any MX switch opener will work on these. I think Wooting has a little kit now with an opener, pullers, tweezers, lube brushes if you're just a regular person and you don't have all this stuff laying around your house already. The first thing we need to do is remove all these switches and they can be pretty tough the first time you pull them out. Any MX switch puller will work. This is my favorite one by far. It's from Wuche. It's 15 bucks and you can pick it up at Canon Keys. This all works much easier if you remove the entire module from the case first. It's just five screws. Real quick on this case, people are finding this carry strap design really polarizing and there were a lot of questions about it. Yes, you can remove it. You actually have to install it when you get it in the box and without it, the edge of the keyboard looks like this. After you get the module out, then you can remove the PCB from the rear of the module. Do this somewhere you're cool with getting messy because there's a lot of stabilizer lube on the PCB so you don't want that on your favorite desk mat. Then you just grab and pinch the top and bottom pushing in the little pins and rock back and forth to release these. It's worth saying that there's no way to get through this process without chipping or scuffing the paint on the plate. This is super common on hot swap boards. It's not limited to the wooding board. It's just kind of the the cost of doing business if you're gonna pull your switches. So these are lightly lubed from the factory, but it's very minimal and inconsistent. Nothing that needs to be cleaned off first. You can just go right over the top of these with some 205 grade zero. To open these, you can just use a simple cheap push down opener or something a little higher end like this OP opener from Gateron. If you're a man, you can just crack these open in your fist. That's not real, don't try that. Some people out there will tell you that you don't need an opener. You can just use a little flathead screwdriver or whatever. Don't do that. Just buy the cheapest opener you can find. If money is an issue, it's gonna be much faster, much easier, and there's no risk to damaging your switch. Wooting does include two extra switches in the box, but you're gonna hate life if you break too many of these trying to use a screwdriver. After experimenting with a few different methods, I'm gonna show you how I lube these. As always, block off a couple hours to do this, and less is more. Less is more. Starting with the stem, you just want to lightly do the rails and the sides. Lightly means you can just see the reflection of the lube. If you can see the white of the lube buildup, you've gone too far. Then I like to do a light layer around the lower stem and the floor of the bottom housing. For the springs, you can bag lube these with GPL 105 oil, which is faster. I have a video on how to do that. I'm out of oil, so I've just been using 205 grade zero on the bottoms, and here I go a little heavier. That's it. I don't touch the top housing. I don't do the lower rails. You can do more if you want to, but that switch should always sound like switch, not like lube. Over lubing makes it make a really weird sound and it makes the switch return feel sluggish. It's the last thing you want on a performance board like this. Even though there is a little play on these switches, they'd probably be a good candidate for filming, but you can't. The rails are slightly too wide and it deforms the film. You'd just make a mess of these if you tried to do this. Now you just endlessly repeat that process until you're done. As I showed in the main review, the stabilizers here are pretty snug in this plate. They did a really good job with these. Normally you have a lot more wobble and that's the major downside of plate mount stabilizers where they snap into the actual plate and 
instead of attaching directly to the PCB. My copy was also super lubed from the factory. These also have flat bottoms, so they don't need to be clipped. Personally, I wouldn't even remove these or replace them, though it's easy to do if you want to. Mine don't have any rattle, but if yours do, I just use a 205 grade zero syringe and call it done. The PCB isn't drilled for stabilizers, so no dice there. If you have a plate mount stab that you really like, you can go for it, but otherwise, I think these are just fine. Once all your switches are lubed, you have a decision to make. If you're gonna run backlit keycaps, you need to put these all back in north facing. This means the little window for the RGB LED is on top or north. If you're gonna run caps that aren't backlit and especially cherry profile like GMK, install them south facing or with that little RGB window on the bottom. I'm using the Tofu 60 aluminum case today because there's a lot of mod videos out there. They come in tons of colors and they're pretty easy to get either direct from KVD fans or from mechanicalkeyboards.com. I'll leave links in the description for everything we talk about today. For mounting, we're gonna go with burger mount. That is, we're gonna sandwich the PCB between these little silicone O-rings to stop it from making full contact with the standoffs in the case. I got this method from Scott over at Keyboard. He's a great guy, great creator, and I'll link his video in the description as well. You should go check him out. After doing this a few times, the best method for me was to feed a screw through an O-ring, then feed that through the PCB and into another O-ring. This prevents you from having to balance those O-rings on top of the standoffs and then try not to knock them off when you put the plate assembly inside the case. So we're gonna lay that module in there and barely tighten most of the screws so they're just hanging on. Don't crank them down. Except for the one by the USB port, you will need to crank that down because we need to get that port in position in the opening. You will have to have this assembly slightly further left than right, just barely off center to get the USB port almost centered in that opening. I used a couple different main methods for sound dampening. The first was this zip fit, just tears apart in these little squares. I did two layers in the lower cavity and one full layer in the main. Two layers is too much to compress. The zip fit with no tape mod still sounded pretty hollow to me, so tape mod is definitely the move for this method. The other method is to just reuse the factory foam from the wooting case. You can just flip this over. I like this because it's really spongy and it compresses down a lot. You'll have to make a little snip for the lower standoff and you'll have to make a little room for the USB connector. If you don't, you're gonna have a hard time getting the USB port to line up. I don't attach the center standoff either in this method. I just go right over the top. So I mean, it's not quite full custom keyboard levels, but it's pretty hard to be mad at this, especially since it houses a performance gaming keyboard inside. The tape mod didn't really do a lot for me in the second method because it was already so compressed, so I could take it or leave it. I didn't have any switch pads, but I did have these little tripods and a big sincere f to whoever invented these. These are easily the most tedious thing I've met yet in keyboards. I'm a little weary of putting anything in between the switch and the PCB because the wooting relies on that very consistent distance between those two things to work its magic, but it doesn't seem to affect performance. It does make the sound a touch cleaner in the tape mod zip fit config, not so much in the stock foam config. No matter how far we've come with the sound at this point, it's really tough to overcome the acoustics of the steel plate and it's still a very firm typing experience. So I scoured the internet for an aftermarket plate for this thing, which was kind of a tough find because you have to have one that works with plate mount stabs. You also have to be careful which material you use. It's important that the plate not have too much flex because you only have 0.1 millimeters of tolerance before those switches start to act off. That's tough. So sadly, there's no easy way to go about this. The FR4 plate I ordered from Epo Maker has a swappable spacebar section, which doesn't work well. And you'd have to find a way to attach standoffs to the plate because these switches aren't technically attached to the PCB. There's no pins, there's no solder, there's no hot swap sockets. Only the fixing pins make contact with the PCB and that's not enough to ensure that the PCB stays attached to the whole assembly. It's the PCB that screws directly into the case, not the plate. So you could mash all this stuff in there, but it's gonna be really janky. And the holes on the 
the PCB don't match up with the holes on the EpoMaker plate, even if I wanted to add my own standoffs. I'm not saying it's impossible to plate swap this thing. I'm just saying you have to cross the line into full custom work, have a plate fabricated for this thing. And even then, no telling if FR4 is gonna be rigid enough to do the job because the tolerances have to be so exact on this board. I saw a lot of comments wondering if Wooting would just make the keyboard module itself available with some different plate options and maybe some PCB mount stabilizers. Wooting saw those comments too. It's not off the table. I'm not saying it's definitely a go, but they're not ruling it out and they are considering it for the future. So getting back to the salvation, I really don't think this is the case for the job in this scenario. Because of those leaf springs, it's tougher to sound dampen than it is the tofu and you're not really gaining anything over the tofu. This whole plate flex or bounce that I can show on camera by pushing in the right spots doesn't translate to the typing feel. It still feels stiff and it just sounds much worse than the tofu, even with the tape mod. On the topic of custom keyboard cables, power delivery can be an issue with this board and aftermarket cables. Coiled cables specifically when using tachyon mode because it's just too much cable length to deliver the power it needs. You can get around this if your motherboard has a feature where you can juice the power to one of the USB ports on the rear of the case. It was called like DAC up on some of the older gigabyte boards, but it's probably best to just use a straight cable if you're gonna go custom. So tofu case, burger mount, whichever sound dampening sounds good to you and lube those switches. That's the move. The wooting is what I've been maining since a month before the original review and sense and what I will continue to main on my gaming desk for the foreseeable future. I can't wait to see some of the crazier community mods people do to this thing as more people continue to get this board in hand. It is awesome that Wooting has given us the ability to do this. Hopefully we do see that full custom module scenario become a reality and we can push it way further than just swapping a case. And speaking of case, the Meshify Lite from Fractal Design features the same iconic angular mesh design and great airflow from the Meshify 2, but at a much more affordable price point. You get the same large interior that supports 360 millimeter radiators up top, 360 millimeters in the front, and 280 in the basement. It includes two HDD slash SSD trays and two dedicated SSD trays for mounting a total of four drives. Plus, you get three 140 millimeter fans included and toolless top latching tempered glass. It supports motherboards up to 285 millimeter EATX and easily fits the large largest graphics cards on the market. It lacks the modular converting interior of the Meshify 2, so you won't be turning this into a big data server, but it's nice that you're not paying for a big feature that you might not use. Front IO is USB-C ready with the optional add-on. Of course, it has all the smart design and great cable routing that Fractal is known for. It has filters everywhere for all that airflow, and it's an absolute breeze to build it. If you want to get your hands on one for yourself, click the link down in the description. Big thanks to Fractal Design for sponsoring today's video, and thank you so much for your time. And I've heard your feedback on all the keyboard stuff. The content will be much more varied as we get into late summer and fall. You IEM fans especially have a lot of audio content on the way. That's it for today. I will catch you all in the next one. Stay up.